you can't plan your life 30 years ahead. You don't need to. And I think that's a pressure that we put on ourselves like, oh my God, what am I doing? Like, what am I gonna be doing when I'm 50? And it's like, well, actually, hopefully you'll be doing something that surprises you. And why not just let your life surprise you constantly? Why make it out like life is this like linear perfect journey where like at 30 I'm gonna do this and at 40 I'm gonna do this and at 50 and it's like well life probably is not gonna go like that and that picture that you have rolling because it won't fit in with what you're experiencing that gap is the pressure that you feel in your life. The reason I'm saying don't put purpose on a pedestal is because then purpose becomes this heavy weight that you're carrying and you're now like judging yourself that you don't know it. And if you instead make your goal to learn about purpose, learn about meaning, explore yourself, experiment, grow, now it becomes like, oh, I'm just experimenting, I'm just learning about myself. If you don't really have an interest, it's going to be really hard. And then when it comes to our soft skills, we go, oh, I'm a good communicator, I'm just gonna stick to that, forget vulnerability. Or I'm a really good talker, forget listening. And that kind of all comes in together. And I think the point is that if we're always learning and figuring out a way to serve in whatever situation we're in, that's, that's the best route for success because that's something that no one can take away from you. We like stress out about not being motivated. We stress out about not finding purpose. But guess what? Just like you've got to eat and shower, you have to find purpose in every day. I think that we have to get as intimate with our dark side as possible. And I feel like when you don't get that intimacy, you don't really understand it. I look back and I think, why did I do that? And it's just always been my desire to experiment, always been my desire to learn, always been my desire to be curious and find out more about myself. The first is to approach any situation with compassion and empathy. The other thing is to recognize that sometimes when we go through pain, it makes us pay attention. Like when we go through pain, it makes us pay attention. When things are going great, we often get complacent. We stop worrying, we get lazy, we, we don't worry about anything, we're just relaxing. And as soon as you feel pain, Pain is a way of your body, of society, of the economy to force you to pay attention. So if you're being lazy and not eating right, your body reacts badly to tell you to stop doing that. So any pain that happens in your life, first of all, is saving you from more pain. And so for me, that's the shift that we have to go through. And that all comes from us deeply looking into our minds and going, where are these blocks turning up from? Where are they coming from? What are their roots? And then how can I replace them with the, the right conversation, the right dialogue internally. When it comes to your hard skills, focus on your strengths. When it comes to your soft skills, focus on your weaknesses. If you do those two things, your life will change dramatically. Because if you're good at something, you'll become exceptional at it. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, embrace life's challenges. Life is challenging. It's full of ups and downs. We think, I wish things could just be still. I wish things would stop changing. I wish my problems would go away. We want a life that's steady with a path that's flat. Yet as Deborah Evans once said, life is like an EKG. Without the ups and downs, you're not living. Because this is what a flat line looks like. And this is what a lifeline looks like. When we feel those highest highs, those extreme peaks, we're ecstatic to be on the summit. Then when we're in the lowest lows, those deep values, we're ready to submit. And so we try and play it safe and avoid all risks. But when we seek security and prioritize passiveness, we don't realize that a flat lifeline means we're dead. If we're always trying to live our lives at sea level, then we'll never see what life is truly about. That what we judge as good and bad are in fact deeply connected. How could we ever experience how wonderful happiness is if we never felt sadness? How could we taste the triumph of success if we never failed? How could we know the comfort of gratitude if we never experienced loss? Somehow we got the idea that being successful and moving forward in life 
means we're constantly moving up. But have you ever read a book, watched a movie, or seen a case study like that? They don't exist. Every story worth telling has peaks and valleys, successes and setbacks. Our brains are wired for novelty. When something's new, whether it's a fantastic surprise or a huge challenge, our brains light up. We thrive on learning and our opportunities to grow. Yet our brains also easily become accustomed to patterns, making it harder for us to change. Dramatic disruptions help us break these patterns and invite us to see and experience the world in a whole new way. And as it turns out, we're designed for change all the way down to ourselves. Your body is constantly being reinvented, replacing most of itself every seven to 15 years, even down to our bones. The universe is constantly shifting and we are part of that. When we try and resist change, it goes against our very nature. In the journey of life, we experience pleasure and pain. There'll be sunshine and rain, there'll be loss and gain, but we must learn to keep moving forward again and again. So if you opened your eyes this morning, if you were healthy enough to move about, to maybe get yourself some food, if you were able to go to a refrigerator and find that it was full and stocked, if you were able to put on some clothes, and if you had a roof over your head, just remember how grateful you can be for all those things we consider to be basic, but for others, they don't even have access to. We can't stop life's ups and downs, but we can change how we experience them. We can learn to go with life's flow. Because as Helen Keller once said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. Rule number three, do something you love. Whenever you give out any energy, love, hate, anger, kindness, you will always get it back one way or another. Love is like a circle. Whatever love you give out, it always comes back to you. I was just showing Sally a Facebook memory backstage seven years ago. I love Facebook reminders. Look at this. It showed me that I was speaking to this little group of students about seven mistakes people make in their 20s. And it was a memory of a talk that I was giving six and seven years ago. I released my first video five years ago. So six and seven years ago, most people didn't know who I was and what I was doing. I had an event in London called Conscious Living. So it was on a Friday night in the city and five to 10 people would show up every week. That's it, five to 10 people. And I remember loving it. And I remember feeling so happy and so grateful that five to 10 people showed up. And I feel the same way about the first five to 10 people that followed me and commented on my videos. And I feel the same way about the first five to 10 people when I finally got to meet them. And I found that if you can love one person, if you can deeply feel grateful for one person, then thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions will come from that. But if you struggle to be present and connected to that one person, it's really hard to be trusted by the universe with more. What is it that success looks like for you? And don't make it about a number. Don't make it about an count of views. Don't make it about a follower. Don't make it about a size of home because those things are great for success but they're not great for happiness. My measure of success is, can I wake up and do something I love every day? Rule number four, never doubt yourself. I think we've come to a place where we feel that freedom and the freedom of unlimited choice is power. And we've all realized, and the science and the studies all show this, that the more choice we have, the worse mistakes we make. And we make poorer decisions based on this complete limitless choice. And I found that actually when you stripped away some of that choice, your ability to make decisions grew. My meditation teacher said to me, even in a shallow dive, you get wet, so still do it. Beautiful, I love that, yeah. The first step, is learning to appreciate where you are. Because if we can't appreciate where we are, we will never appreciate where we get to. 
And I often say to people, like, you're exactly where you need to be. And we're scared of accepting that because we're like, well, I don't like being here, but that's because we don't see it as part of our story. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of it truly is that I've seen the most powerful dreams be linked to service and impact. And so when your dream expands into having a service element, you get the opportunity to work harder than you've ever dreamed of. You're able to learn things that you never believed you could because we're so phenomenal at extending ourselves beyond what we know for people that we love and people we want to serve. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, appreciate every person in your life. I think one of the biggest mistakes I've made, and I think we make as humans, is we often look for divinity in humanity. Mm. You're looking for that divine person that has all the answers and that is infallible and perfect. And when you seek divinity in humanity, you're left with insecurity and anxiety because no one fulfills that divine search. And so for me, what I really had to understand as I went down that road and felt like I was let down and felt like people made me feel unworthy or unequipped was I recognized that there were four pillars of relationships and they are care, competence, consistency, and character. Every single person in your life is going to be able to give you or should be able to give you at least one of these four characteristics. Very rarely, if ever, will one person give you all four. And if you're lucky, you might have a few people in your life that give you two or three. So let's talk about each of them. Care. My mom, there is no one in the world who cares for me more than my mom. She would do anything for me. She'd be there for me. All she wants to make sure, doesn't matter what I've achieved or what I've done. If she picks up the phone to me, her first question is, have you eaten? <laughs> what did you eat? Uh, are you safe? Are you healthy? Right? Like that's all she cares about. Now, my mom isn't the person that I go to for business advice, or she's not the person, I'm saying hypothetically, that I go to for social media advice. Mm. That's not her competence, but she doesn't need to be. She cares for me, and that's what I get from her. Now, let's go to competence. If I'm thinking about starting a business, new dragon <laughs> over here, right? Like, you'd be a great friend to call up. You're someone who understands what it takes to get investors, scale a business, build teams, manage internationally, grow, scale, sell. Like you have that journey and you have that network, you have that career. I'd also care about you. I know you also care about me. So I've got two out of four in you. Yeah. And you've got good character. You don't have the consistency though, because no. we don't see each other yeah. enough. So, so three out of four. 75%. Yeah, 75%. And so for that, for me, is that perfect example of there's competence there and there is care there, which is wonderful. And there's character there. I believe you're someone of good character. And that's the next one, character. There are some people in our life that hold us to higher values. They help us grow with greater integrity. They help us see things beyond what we're chasing. They make us look beyond our desires and make us recognize that there's so much more to life. And those people are massively important. And those people may not be the people we see every week. They may not be the people we see every day. They may not be the people that we call up, but you need them as your compass. The people with character are your compass. And then finally, you have the people that are consistent. You have some mates that you just know are always going to pick up the phone. Mm. You know that if you need to move house, you've got a family emergency, you know which friend you call. They may not be the competent business advisor. They may care about you, but they don't care about you as deeply as your mom does, but they are consistently always there for you. Mm. And that's beautiful. But the problem is when we look at our consistent friend, we think, well, why are you not competent? And we look at our competent friend, we think, 
Why don't you have good character? We look at our character friend and say, well, why aren't you always there? And so we're always looking for which C they don't have mm. rather than appreciating for them for exactly what they bring to our life. Rule number six, become more self-aware. On a mental level, what's self-awareness? Knowing what type of people I like to be with, knowing who helps me grow and who drains me. Yeah. That's mental self-awareness. So self-awareness at every level, and then we go into the spiritual consciousness level. That's disconnecting from all these identities and understanding the identity that we are wired for generosity and we're wired to serve. And only in service can we be happy. And that's us on a consciousness level. That's the identity of consciousness. Like water is wet, the sun is heating in light. Consciousness is service. Mm. Like that's how it fits. Why are we wired for that? We're wired for that because all of us as consciousness have been designed, and we see it since like even kids, like I was, I was giving this example of this beautiful, and you may have seen it. It, it, it went viral on Instagram. It was this little girl, probably about two years old, watching a cartoon, and she takes a handkerchief, and the cartoon character's crying, and she goes up to the television, no. and she tries to wipe it off, right? And it's, it's, it's incredible because this girl's two years old, and she thinks this cartoon character animal is crying and she gets a real tissue and tries to wipe it on the TV. Obviously, it doesn't work. And there's another, another one that I saw with this statue of this rabbit, and there's like four rabbits, and one rabbit's like falling off the end, uh -huh. and this little boy is trying to push the rabbit up, but it's a stone rabbit, it's just a statue. But he's trying to help it back up. So we see, and there was a great article in Wired about this, about how we're wired for generosity. Our, our brain is happier in service. This whole world is almost a school an education system to make us realize that one truth. And we see that when we're serving, when we're doing that, we feel genuine happiness. But when we're trying to gain and greed and power and strength, we even feel empty as it slips through our fingers. So the why is because that allows us to connect to our deepest self, the happiest self that we have. And modern studies have shown that. So Michael Norton at Cambridge University he did a study where they gave people five, 10, $20 to spend on themselves. Have you seen this? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, and then they spent five, 10, $20 on others. So people spent five, 10, $20 on makeup, Starbucks, and normal stuff, <laughs> right, right, right? That was the, that was the three, common, three, makeup, Starbucks, and then something else, I can't remember. And then people who spent on other people, they also bought other, the same stuff. Starbucks was still in there, yeah. and they're buying all this stuff. What they found is that when people self-assess their happiness before and after, without knowing about this A-B test, people who spent the money on themselves didn't feel any happier or any less happier. But the people that spent on others felt 10 to 20% happier. Mm. And then he went and tried this out. This was a college in, in the United States. They then went and did it in Africa, they did it all over the world, and the stats and the patterns showed the same. Wow. That we're wired for generosity, we're wired to serve, to make us realize that that's our real nature, that's our greatest self-awareness. Rule number seven, be of service to others. I'd say that in, in my heart and my intention, I've, I've only wanted to do good for others and serve others and support others. So whenever I, even when I started creating content or even when I worked in the city or when I became a monk, my, my intention was always to serve and to help others. My intention was never motivated by uh, big results or anything that's happened in my life today. I never thought it would happen. And, and I never even believed that that was the goal or that was the reason I was doing it. The reason I was doing it was I believe that I uncovered this incredible wisdom and I wanted to share it. That was it. And so I think sometimes our intention gets uh, dirty or messy. Uh, sometimes really our intention is ego driven or sometimes it's uh, money driven or sometimes it's results driven. And none of those things are bad. You can have money, you can be famous, you can be successful. But if that is your reason for doing it, if that is your intention for doing it, it won't satisfy you even if you get there. And actually, if you do it for a deeper reason, you'll probably get there faster and you'll be happier when you actually receive it. And so one thing for me is, and I work on this every day, it's not that I've mastered it, but every day I'm working on my intention to always be of service, to always want to help. Rule number eight, meet incredible people. I was really fortunate to meet incredible people when I was young. I met a few people that absolutely transformed my life. 
I'm eternally indebted to them, grateful to them. And I owe it all to them. And so I give all my success to them, you know, without meeting those amazing mentors and those phenomenal thought leaders and thinkers who are not famous, who are not known, who are not present, like they're not, they're not in the social media world. They're not big names or whatever. Those people, you know, those people, if I never met them, none of this would have happened. And I can see the emotion in your face when you say this. Yeah, I just, I, I really, you know, we, we skipped it earlier, but I, I just feel like the gratitude that I have for people who saw potential in me when I didn't see it in myself, that is just the greatest gift you can give to someone. Like I today have self-awareness and I have confidence and I know who I am. And I, I, I wasn't always like that. Like there were tons of years where I was insecure and you know, I was bullied for being overweight and I was bullied for being the only Indian at school. And there was so much like baggage to do with just my body, my how I, how language I used and all this kind of stuff. And to, to have someone notice that you may have something. I mean, you've had that and that is just, you, you like honor that person for the rest of your life. And the best thing is those people don't even want it. So, you know, the, the best thing about all of this is the people there are not going, oh yeah, we did that. They're, they're actually saying, no, 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 it's not us. Like it's you. And, and I think that's the beauty of that. So I, I have to say that I, it's important that I share that answer, not because I'm trying to give a, a more strategic answer, but I think it's important because it is a big part of it. And so that would be the monks that I met, it would be the coaches that I met, the guides that I met. Looking at it from a very practical, strategic standpoint, shifting now, my parents forced me to go to public speaking and drama school when I was 11 years old. And I really didn't wanna go because I was shy, I was unconfident, I was insecure about being on stage or being in a public setting. I actually loved acting growing up. I really enjoyed acting and doing theater and things like that, where I was playing another character. But being myself on stage, that was the last thing I wanted to do. And my parents saw that and they saw that as something that I should work on. So they forced me and my school to enroll me in a public speaking course. So from the age of 11 through to the age of 18, for three hours a day, three days a week, so nine hours a week, for seven years, I went to public speaking school. Really? For seven years Makes of sense. my life, I went to public speaking school. Wow. So when I look back at my ability to communicate, my ability to understand ideas, and by the way, public speaking school is examination based too. So we had exams where they would give you a topic 15 minutes before. You have 15 minutes to research a topic from the books in the room that they give you because there was no smartphone at the time when we were 11, 12 years old. And you'd have to create a speech in 15 minutes about that subject from the books that were in the room. You had to read from a book that you'd never read before. They'd pick a random page and they'd ask you to read it out. So the examination of a public, and this was at the London Academy of Music, Drama and Arts, it's called Lambda. Uh, and that's where I studied for seven years. So that's a very strategic skill set that I had the time to develop thanks to my parents. You know, like without my parents, that none of that would have ever happened. And I think that's a big part of why people are hopefully appreciate how I communicate ideas because I've spent a lot of time understanding communication. But when I was 18, I had nothing to talk about. So even though I had all these tools and skills, I didn't really use them because I didn't care about anything. So sure, I gave a good presentation at university and work experience and an internship, but it was never something that brought me to life. And so then when I met the monks and I got an opportunity to study the Vedas, which are 5,000 years old, and again, we were put through rigorous study. We sat down, we had to learn verses, we had to analyze purports, commentaries on ancient scriptures. We had to do comparative analysis of religions and tradition. Like when I was a monk, we were massively trained in philosophical analysis. And that to me gave me a real strength and confidence in these ideas. So some of the ideas I present today that may sound simple, they're based on these really ancient deep truths that I've had the time to grapple with, with the greats who really understand them. So that to me is a big benefit I've had where I've had three years of complete dedication to studying philosophy and not just studying the intellectual areas, but the practical and the applicable areas as well. So thanks to my monk teachers who gave me that. Rule number nine, make your sleep better. Can you tell me what you do for sleep? Since this was an add on to the uh, time acronym, what's your sleep schedule and what's your, uh, do you have a, a, a bedtime and a wake up routine? Yeah, for sure. So I, and so I love Mariana's book, Sleep Revolution too. I think it's unbelievable if you really want to convince yourself that sleep is important because I think a lot of us undervalue sleep or we undervalue 
sleep before midnight. We undervalue quality sleep. We don't understand what it means. And so I think it's really important. And I think she has a line in there that says something like, this is how you sleep your way to the top. And she talks about how, you know, how successful people can sleep their way to the top, which I love. Uh, but yeah, so for me, sleep is, you know, I, for a long time, obviously living as a monk, we didn't sleep for long, but we meditate for long periods of time, which kind of created that deep sense of rest. But now that I don't have that, I have a very simple schedule where I sleep by 10 p.m. and I'm up at 6 a.m. And I really find that eight hours and 15 minutes, to be exact, is like my sweet time. And I've noticed that and I've measured that and I've checked that to see what works for me. Because at times when I had seven to nine hours, I was like, all right, let me sleep for seven and get up and be fine. And I was experimenting with seven, seven and a half hours. And I found that actually for me to be my optimal Eight hours and 15 minutes is my sweet spot. And for a lot of people, they're like, wow, you're sleeping a lot. That's a lot of time. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm at my best. Like, that's what I want. Why would I want to sleep seven, have an extra hour and 15 minutes, but then lose four hours because I'm unproductive and unhappy and not at my best? That's the opportunity cost that you have to measure. See, we're measuring, like, what could I do with one an hour and 15 minutes? My question to you is, what's your energy during that one hour and 15 minutes that you gained from taking it away from your sleep? And, and my, I believe that the ability to be productive in less time is more powerful than to spread it over more time. So I, I, I do that 10 a.m. and 6 a.m. is when I wake up usually. I train myself after that eight hours, 15 minutes. I know that's how much I'm going to sleep, so I don't wake up to an alarm. Uh, I really enjoy waking up without an alarm. If you need an alarm because you, and I, and I don't sleep in or snooze in, by the way. I'm, I'm up at that time because my body is now used to it. But one thing I'd recommend is don't wake up to your phone and don't have your phone in your bedroom before you go to bed. So get a real alarm clock. I remember ordering when I first did this, a little Timex alarm clock, and I would lock my phone and my laptop in my car outside so that I wouldn't even go to them. So I would lock them the night before because it was so easy for me to just leave my phone there. Yeah. And so when I wake up in the morning, again, I can't look at my phone. My alarm wakes me up. And this is one thing I'd really add the sound you wake up to is so important for your mental state. And this is not spoken about enough. Most of the sounds that wake up stuff in the morning, whether it's your mom or dad shouting at you, or whether it's a really annoying alert tone, which most phones have, those are actually shocking you into being awake. You are now waking up with anxiety and now you're carrying that anxiety throughout the day. Waking up to nature sounds, waking up to calming sounds, waking up to the sound of a gong or cymbals or uh, ocean sounds, like so, sounds like that are so much better for you to wake up to. Because imagine literally like, try, imagine trying to, you know, how many cars can go from zero to 60 miles per hour in two to three seconds? Not many. And when you're putting your foot on the gas like that with a jolt and a shock, your body's now waking up in shock. And so I would really be careful about the first thing you see in the morning and the first thing you hear in the morning because those two things, those senses are so powerful. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is become more disciplined. I would say my life is purposeful, which has both elements. So, so what I mean by that is my life is easy because I know what I want to do, what I stand for, I know what I believe in. But it's difficult because I have to put in hours, I have to put in work, I have to be organized, I have to live a disciplined life. Uh, but discipline, funnily enough, actually makes life easier. So people think dif discipline is difficult, but, but the result of discipline is that life becomes easier. And so waking up every day and meditating or going to the gym is difficult. It's difficult, it's not easy, it's, it's, it's challenging. But the result of that is life becomes easier. So I'd say that I'm dedicated to difficult discipline, but that because it's purposeful and it has meaning become makes life easier to live. If that answers your question. It does. It does. Yeah. But, um, and I'm asking you this for selfish reasons <laughs> because I, I, I have, I have difficult days even today, you know, with, with so many blessings around me, established businesses, there are days where I'll wake up not feeling completely motivated slash not feeling completely worthy. Yeah. Uh, I'm just asking you this kind yeah. of as a younger brother. Oh yeah, for like, sure, bro. Uh, do you for sure. I still have that. I wake up days where I feel stressed, where I feel under pressure, where I feel like I've just got so much to do and 
you know, I haven't got the support I need or, you know, all of that. Like I, I experience all of that. And, and what I say to people is that training your mind and your body is not about never feeling that way again. It's not that one day that won't happen. It's that you let it affect you for less time. So in the past, you and me, maybe when it happened, when bad things would happen, you'd be thinking about it for like a whole month. But now when something happens, you think about it for a week. And then in a year from now, you'll think about it for one day. And then in a year from now, you'll think about it for one hour. And then a year from now, you'll think about it for one minute. And that's the goal. The goal is not to never feel stress. The goal is to feel it for less and less time. Because the point is that most of us allow stress and pressure to consume us. And so the less you let it consume you is the goal. But the problem is that when you have the goal that I should wake up and feel perfect every day, that goal puts its own pressure and stress into your life. So I wake up, man, I, I'm with you. Like, as, as, as you said, as a younger brother, which I appreciate you saying that means a lot to me, but as, as an older brother, like I would say, dude, I feel stressed. I feel pressure. I still have bad mood swings sometimes, but that's part of it. And, and that reminds you how far you have to go and it keeps you humble and it keeps you grounded. And also it helps you empathize with people more. Because if you never felt that way, and then someone tells me, if a young person comes up to me and says, Jay, I feel stressed. And I'm like, oh, come on, just get over it. Like there is no such thing as stress. That's not true. And so I find that when I feel stressed or fearful or anxious, I explore it a little deeper so that next time someone says that to me, I can actually feel empathy and compassion for them because I know how it feels. And so actually, I, I actually feel like going through pain is the best thing for a content creator because that's how you truly empathize with people. If you don't go through pain, then you can never relate to anyone. We spend away so much energy focusing on the success of others that we don't spend enough energy focusing on developing our own success. Imagine all the energy you're channeling towards someone else's success and just going, how come they have that? And you could channel that and say, actually, how do I create meaningful relationships in my life? How do I create relationships that I'm happy about? Just that switch completely changes the course of your life, right? Completely, that's all the switch that we need to make. And that's the switch where your intelligence leads the mind rather than the mind leading the intelligence. When the mind leads the intelligence, the mind gets caught in that web of the mentality that, oh, I don't have enough, I'm, I'm not good enough. And that's one of the interesting things that, there's no limits on the amount of holidays you can take. There's no limits on the amount of billionaires in the world. There's no limits on the amount of millionaires in the world. There's no limits on the amount of successful people in the world. There really isn't, right? There's nowhere where it says that there will only be a hundred millionaires on this planet. There will only be 10 billionaires on this planet. There aren't rules like that. They're not written anywhere. But we tell ourselves there are, we make ourselves feel that there are. So we constantly put ourselves into this victim mindset where we feel Oh, but that doesn't happen to me. That doesn't work for me, right? That's not going to happen for me. So we need to remove that. And that's the mind leading. When the mind leads, it tells us there's a limit on success. There's a limit on this. There's a limit on that. If that person has it, I can't have it. Now that's not true at all. If your friend just went on a nice holiday to Mauritius or Thailand or wherever it is in the world, that doesn't stop you. Okay, you can't have their seat on the plane that they've booked, given. But there's so many other seats, there's so many other flights. And we've got to start recognizing that. We've got to start connecting with that. And that's where we shift from the mind leading our dialogue to the intelligence leading our dialogue. The intelligence leads with insight. Let me be compassionate to our, towards myself. Let me be conscious. Let me care. The mind leads with impulse or ignorance and takes us down the wrong route. Imagine you've got two friends. You're sitting with two friends, right? One is the mind, one is your intelligence. Your intelligence will be stronger based on what you read, what you absorb, that tofu soaked in your intelligence, what you're taking in every day, what you're thinking about. That's when your intelligence gets stronger. It's the one that you feed, right? The one that you feed. Are you feeding your mind or are you feeding your intelligence? Ask yourself that question right now. Right? How many of you are feeding your intelligence on a daily basis versus your mind? The one you feed more gets stronger. Right, the one you feed more gets stronger. The one you feed with more intensity, more absorption gets stronger. I think washing your dishes is something everyone does every day or it's a common thing that people do. And the, 
you've got to realize that what you're doing is not washing the dish. Like in terms of that's not actually what you're doing. What you're doing is training your mind for presence. Mm. And the reason why that's so powerful is because most of us, when we're washing the dishes, oh, I, I need to watch that Netflix show. I've got 30 minutes before, you know, like I'm going to sleep late if I don't see it. So now you're already trying to figure out what you're doing next. And that bleeds into the rest of your life. So now when you're finally on that, guess what, this is it. Everyone's going through quarantine and lockdown, going, I need to travel. I need to travel, I need to get out. And when you live like that, when you're traveling, you'll be thinking, oh, I need to do work. I need to get back to work. I need to get my career back on track. And then when you're at work, you're gonna be like, oh, I need to get away again. And that's literally the repetitive cycle that we're all living in. So when you're just washing your dish in a present way, you're not washing a dish. You're training your mind to be where you physically are and the best way to do that is give it meaning like you said, or do something that makes you more present at the time. You could, if you really wanted to, wash the dish and listen to your favorite song. You could wash the dish and listen to this podcast. You could wash the dish and do something that is good for your mind that helps you be more present and conscious at the time. So you may say, Jay, I don't have enough time to wash the dishes for 10 minutes, <laughs> like one dish for 10 minutes. And I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm saying is, don't constantly be in a rush to get onto something you want to do because then when you're doing what you want to do, you'll be in a rush to get onto the thing you have to do mm. and that cycle never stops. And, and I think that's the never ending cycle that we're in that we always feel we're ahead or behind. We always feel we're never where we're meant to be and that's the root of all of our suffering in life is that I don't feel I am where I actually am meant to be. Don't settle. I just don't settle. You don't, you don't, just don't, don't think that you're at the peak of what you were meant to do because you probably don't know unless you try. Mm -hmm. And so for most people, I feel like just don't settle because I think we just give in too early and don't settle for service, right? It's like, that's the reason, that's the intention. It's like service yeah. is the one that's pulling you along. And so don't settle for service. The world needs service. The world yeah. needs your service. The world needs your genius. The world needs your passion and you just don't know it yet. Mm. And, and the day you realize it, you'll be grateful that you went the whole way. As, as I know, we, like I feel, I, I look back and I'm just like, God, like I would have just been sitting there working in a corporate job and not known all the people I know now and connected with this amazing community and met you. I just wouldn't have had it. And so if, you didn't go for it. if I didn't go for it, if I, didn't, if I just settled that my service was this. So don't settle for service. Mm -hmm. Service deserves the best of you. When I take a 10,000 foot view of who you are and what you do, it, it it seems to me that your your gift or your your real facility is this ability, this facility for taking ageless wisdom, these spiritual precepts, these philosophical tenets and ideas, and translating them in uh, an entertaining way and a digestible way for a very broad mainstream and 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 perhaps young you know audience. Is that fair? Sounds good to me. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, you know, it's, there was, there's a statement by Albert Einstein, which kind of underpins all my work. And it's, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. Mm -hmm. And when I was exposed to the Vedas and all these spiritual texts that some of them date 5,000 years back, I was reading them and I was like, there is magic in these texts. Like there is so much energy in these texts. There's so much weight and gravitas and there's so much power, but guess what? most people will never be able to experience it because it's in another language. And when I say another language, I don't just mean Sanskrit or Hindi or you know, and, you know, Chinese. I'm, I mean another language of it's speaking to a different age. And there's beauty in that and I love that. And, and I appreciate that, but I could see that I wanted to try and see if I could explain these things to people that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And I was always connecting with the person who grew up in London. You know, I'm a born and raised in London. I grew up liking anything an average Londoner is into, but I got so fascinated because of the way the philosophy was presented to me. And I felt a responsibility to want to do that for others. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty good uh, breakdown in 10,000 foot view. And, yeah. and, I, and I appreciate you saying that because that's what fascinates me. That's where I get my buzz from is how do I read, study and learn so that I can share, support and serve. And that's, that's where I get my, my meaning from. The challenge is that we think things come with emotions. Feelings. We think things come with feelings and emotions. And guess what they don't. So if you chase money. Well, they might for a moment, right? Or they won't. 
I don't think they even do. It's a false sense of feeling. It's such a false sense of feeling. I don't, uh-huh. maybe for a moment, but it's so short lived that it's it's not even worth counting almost. Mm-hmm. So it's like when you when you think that I'm chasing money, guess what? You will get money. Yep. And that's great. Money is really important. And money is a really important resource. But guess what? Money's not now gonna fill that gap, that void, that feeling, that emotion that you're missing in your life. What are and most so, people missing? We're missing a deep sense of love. I think, I think the biggest need in the world, as we've heard many times before from all the ancient texts, they, they, they summarize it like this, to love and be loved. Like that is the need of humanity, to love and be loved. And when we don't experience that, we then start looking for status. We then start looking for money. Then we then start looking for recognition. To, to help us give the feeling of false sense of love. Correct. And the challenge is because most of us didn't experience that from our parents, and this is the key thing, what we crave in life is what we did or didn't get from our parents. Mm -hmm. What our parents did give us is what we continue to crave, or what they didn't give us is what we continue to crave. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that most people's love languages that they chase are things that their parents didn't give them. So if their parents didn't give them time, they now crave everyone's time. If their parents didn't give them gifts, gifts, they crave gifts. If their parents didn't give them acts of service, they're craving those acts of service. So it's because of our childhood. And if we don't learn to process all of that Mm -hmm. experience, which most people never get the time to do, and, and I empathize with that because I've had to go through that. I've seen me repeating my parents' patterns. Mm. I've seen What was the thing you were craving? So I would crave a big thing for me was I would crave surprises and gifts because that's your thing. Yeah, yeah. that's my thing. Still is your thing. It's still my thing. Yeah. And and I did your parents not do that for you? No, they did. A, my mom did a lot of it. That's why so, you still crave correct. it. Correct. So my mom would always every year on my birthday, she'd always surprise me with the one thing I wanted. And I wasn't spoiled growing up. I didn't yeah, have a yeah. lot growing up. But she would get that one thing, whether it was like a Power Rangers toy right. or whether it was whatever it was. You yeah. know, something. You Video know, game. Yeah. Thing like is, you want as a kids, right? And she would always surprise me with that. And that became so deep rooted. Now I'll give you an example. When I then married my wife, you just expect people to know that. That they're gonna do the same thing. Totally. And so now- She didn't do that. No, because I'm expecting my wife to be like my mom in the sense of I expected a surprise or show me love in the same way. Uh And she doesn't know that. She's not a mind reader. I can't explain, expect her to know that. So it took communication. It took time for me to explain that. So anyway, I think that's where it stems from. That desire, it doesn't come from any, you can say it comes from society and education. Of course it does. But I think the deepest place it comes is what your parents did or didn't give you. Mm -hmm. That's that's where it comes from. Something that happens is you have to surround yourself by peers in a space too who understand you and don't see you as competition. And that's really hard and it's like a fine line. I genuinely believe that collaboration wins always. So I, my whole approach to most things has always been, hey, I wanna collaborate with you. Whether I'm bigger on social media or smaller on social media, I'm just like, I just wanna work together because I think that's gonna win long term for all of us. Both, not just in terms of success and numbers, but more in terms of, I wanna be friends with you. And so I reach out regularly to people that I admire in different ways and I reach out to them and say, hey, I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to learn from you. I'd love to connect. I'd love to be a friend. Like, not I'd love to, for you to teach me how you do this. And if that comes naturally from that relationship, amazing. If it never evolves into that, I've just got a great friend who now gets me. So I try and make friends in two areas. One is in an area of people who understand my life because I feel the conversations you can have with someone who does exactly what you do are just so great because they already get you, right? And uh, someone that I had on my podcast lately, her name's Lily Singh, Superwoman. Uh, She's become a recent friend. She's been incredibly and is incredibly successful on social media. She's using her platform for doing amazing good in the world. And she was someone I reached out to because I was just like, hey, like you've been doing all of this for a while. You started on YouTube a lot longer than I did. And I would just love to connect from you and hear from you. And she's become an incredible friend and we've just been sharing ideas and learning together and it's like that relationship's awesome. And then at the same time, I'm trying to find people who are not in media. So I still have friendships with the monks back in India and I just spent January in India for a month. I was meditating again for for roughly about 21 days and I have them in my life because they remind me of like the roots and they remind me of the truths that bring me back. So I kind of like both. I love people who totally get my space and usually those are people I reach out to and then I love 
having my roots down. So most of my inner circle now is from people I've reached out to. Or they become people who've been reaching out to me for a long, long time and have been consistently reaching out to me asking for nothing. I've seen some stories about some phenomenal Paralympians. I've seen some phenomenal stories about human beings who without arms and legs have achieved extraordinary feats. And this blows my mind because I always think like it's, some of us have challenges in different areas, but imagine being born without legs or arms or, you know, like actually not having stuff that we all take for granted. But those are like, for some people, that would be an absolute dream to have that. Now through robotics and bionic limbs, they can have that. But for years they've lived without it, but still seen, I've seen positivity in them. I've seen drive in them. I've seen a desire in them to achieve something phenomenal. So it's amazing what's happening out there. And we really have to connect with those stories rather than living in our small bubble. And often because we only live in our small bubble, we talk to the same people. Right, one of the biggest challenges with envy is that we talk to the same people and they talk to each other. So our group is so small that we only hear the same stuff and we kind of start living as if that bubble of life is real. Everyone you love and respect and look up to, that's been their path. And I think that's what's given me so much, that's what's liberated me from it. Like Steve Jobs is one of my biggest role models in, in certain areas of his life. And when I've read his, autobiog uh, his biography, sorry, by Walter Isaacson, it's like the guy has failed so many times, yet all of us, like most of us, have a phone that's an iPhone or an Apple product in our home or whatever it is. It's like he's not worried about all those times that went wrong because it, he obviously won big in, in this area of his life. So my take's just everyone you look up to, whether it's an athlete, an entrepreneur, a coach, a CEO, whatever it is, they have messed up so many times. And just know that. So when you're messing up, you're on the path. Like you're on the same path. Right, and, and I, yeah, I encourage people to share what they're failing at too, because it just helps. I'd say I was quite rebellious and independent even as a monk. A lot of part of a monk's life is conforming and accepting authority and following a path. And those are all beautiful things for people who, who, who like those things. For me, it was a great training ground and a great system of giving me abilities and skills and habits that I didn't have before. But then I really felt a deep calling in my heart to want to share this in a specific way. So I, I kind of feel dragged to do what I do now because it's so deeply in me to want to make things relevant, non-sectarian, universal, and accepting of all truths and paths. It's just, it's just there and I can't ignore it. And I got to a point in my monk life where I just felt I, I can't ignore this desire to want to go and spread this wisdom and insight in a way, independently, in a way that I feel will work and help people, you know, from an impact point of view. And so that was a big part of it. I usually write down each option that I have in life. And I think we all have different options in life. And then I'll place a word above it that feels like the right emotion. So either it can be fame. I could be doing something just because of ego and fame. I could be doing something out of love. I could be doing something for money and stability. I could be doing something for, uh, for inspiration and passion. So I try and define why it's defining that why, that intention behind mm. it. Like why would I take that extra flight off to mm. Singapore? Oh, because I'm going to make X amount of money, right? Like, and, and, and literally when you look at your life weed. like that, yeah, or like, yeah, there you go. And, and then I'd be like, okay, that's a weed. Now, can I transform it into a seed? Is there a way for me to make it more intentional, purposeful and conscious? If I can, that's amazing. I'll do that. But if I can't, I, I need to stop taking things like that into my life. And now I understand for anyone listening, there are times in our life where money has to be the motivator because we need security, we need stability. But when you do it intentionally, at least then you don't expect that thing to bring you the greatest happiness because you know what purpose it's serving in your life. So I know a lot of people who'd love to quit their jobs and live their passion, but I'm like, no, but you know why, if you know why you're doing the job you're doing, you won't expect it to make mm, you happy. Mm, you will know what it excellent, serves, excellent. right? What role it serves excellent. in your life. In um, shamanism, we have this viewpoint that spirituality is not separate from life. It's, it, it means as someone who's spiritual, even if they don't meditate or work with crystals or do any of these things, it means they're willing to evolve. I want to know what your thought is about that. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's beautiful and completely aligns with me. I don't think, see, we look at everything about, oh, what can I learn? And actually half of learning, in my opinion, is really unlearning. Everyone already has the answer inside of them. You're not really learning anything new, you're just trying to get rid of all the bad lessons you learned. And everyone has that, so it's not so much about like, oh, is this person going from here to here? It's not really that, it's like, is someone going from here to here? 
And for me, one of the ways I've always thought about it is you can't take the world further than where you visited internally. So for me, every person that we're meeting already has that journey right there. And all you're asking them to do is look inwards as opposed to outwards. So no, I, I completely agree with you. And I think that's a beautiful point that you've shared. And I think it's something nice for us to know so that we don't judge and label people. We don't walk around and think, oh, those are spiritual people. Those are not spiritual people. Because, yeah, we're all. Yeah. We're all spiritual people. Yeah. And it's just that some are covered. It's like the sun's always out. But often it's covered with the clouds. Rarely here, a bit more lately. But some, it's, the sun is always out. It's just get covered by the clouds, and that's us. We've just been covered. And we get covered by those clouds, and they cloud our identity. They cloud our perception. And so all we're doing for ourselves and others is clearing out the clouds. And the more we do that for ourselves, the more we can do it for others, and the more we do it for others, the more we do it for ourselves. In 2016, I moved out to New York. So just let me paint a picture of 2016. I moved three jobs. I got married. Wow. I moved country. And I just, just started a whole new life. Like my life just transformed. So we went through all of that with my wife yes. in one year. And by the way, all of that was surprises. The job change was surprises. Yeah. The country change was a surprise. The marriage was not a surprise. We planned right, that. Right, 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 right. But apart from everything else, everything was a surprise. Now I said I like surprises, so I can <laughs> roll with it. But my point is that's a lot of transition in a so year. So much transition. And I felt the burden of being in a new city where we had no family, we had no friends. And my wife, who loves being around her family and no one understands just how close she is to them, I felt this burden on me that I had taken away her time with her mm. family and now she was alone. So I was going out to work and she'd be crying at home. Mm. And I was thinking, she's got no friends, she's got no support. And I know you can relate to this yes. with moving it's and relationships lot, and so much going on. And so it's like, I'm dealing with that. And guess what, six months later, I have to leave and move on and tr work on a new career to build everything myself and then I'm four months away from being broke. And so on top of all of this, I've now got four months away from being broke. I've got enough money, money saved for four months to pay for rent and groceries and in that's New York it. City. In New yeah. York City, and that's <laughs> it. And guess what, even on top of that, I've got 30 days before my visa runs out and I'm kicked out of the country. So I can't even live here anymore. So not only have I just got married, moved job three times, changed career again, had to move into an apartment, four months of being broke, and I might get kicked out in 30 days, and my renewal for my visa cost $15,000. Oh. So that's gonna eat into those four months. I have probably never been under that much emotional, yeah. physical, and, and mental pressure in my life. Like genuinely, I felt it. And I felt my body change. My, my breath was more stressed. I would be breathing faster, shorter, shorter breaths, not deep breaths, heart beating not faster, out. not working out. You get into lazy habits, you start craving junk food. Sugar, you have energy. I'm yeah. living in a 500 square foot apartment with my wife, which is, which is tiny, like everything's in that space. And guess what, we both work from home. So I'm now sitting at a desk, hunched over, trying to figure stuff out. She's trying to cook in the same room. Like I'm trying to, just, just trying to figure out what to do. And I remember the next morning, sending like a hundred emails to people and just being like, this is who I am, this is what I can do, how can we serve? And that was the same year that I ended up meeting you later yeah. in that year. Mm -hmm. And the beginning three months of that journey was so stressful, like they were so stressful because I was like, what if I have to move back to London? What am I gonna say to her parents? I mean, I just took their daughter away. Like, uh, <laughs> just I've, got married, I've yeah. lived in New York City for six months and my life's falling apart. Like, you know, so much. And I've got all these views, but there's nothing, there's nothing mm. happening in. We met. You also, you also, I mean, at this time, you're also growing so much. How are you able to create and reach this impact with your videos as yeah. that's growing? while you're under so much stress and uncertainty. And I stopped a bit at that time, like things slowed down hard, like things slowed down. I remember that. I, I wasn't creating as much as I was because I don't enjoy creating from stress or pressure and I don't think you can really create something from stress and pressure. So we really slowed down at that time. And when I was creating, I was creating from a place of recognizing that I could share what I had learned and what I had grown in so far. So anything I was sharing was like, this is what I've learned so far. So that was the biggest pain that I've been through in the last seven years, right. for sure. And all I can say is that I remember coming home to my wife knowing that this was gonna be the truth. And I came home and I said to her, I said to her, I guarantee you, this is gonna be the best thing that ever happened to us. What, the pain? The pain. I said that to her the night I came home wow. and then she gave up to that. I literally came home, I looked her in the eyes and go, this is the scenario. 
And I just want you to know that I guarantee to you, this is the best thing that's ever gonna happen to us. And I said to her, and this is, this is a monk statement that we used to repeat, I said to her, I'm just not gonna judge the moment. Don't judge the moment, because what we do is we try to label moments as good or bad. And when you label a moment as bad, it now does not have the opportunity to become good. I'll give an example. If I go, I don't like this book, this book's bad, right? And I don't, and I love this book. But if I say that, sure. guess what? I will never pick it up and recognize the value that's mm. inside of it because you've labeled it. Yes. And we label stuff, like we label, oh, that restaurant's bad. Mm. But when you label a that moment, person's bad that now. person's bad. Now mm. you can't learn from that person. Oh, a great one, that's a really good one. Mm. As soon as you start labeling people or anything as good or bad, you limit it. You stop it from being something else. And here's the truth, every moment can evolve into being anything if you give it the opportunity to. Right. But as soon as you say it's got no value anymore, you lose it. And so for me, I had to say to myself, don't judge the moment. And I'd keep repeating that don't to myself. Don't judge where you're at. Don't judge What's this. What's happening. Yeah, don't judge it as negative. Don't, don't just start saying it's negative. Because guess what, we've all been in positions where a gift turned into a curse and a curse turned into a That's gift. That's true. Right? We've also Where our been dreams came true and it ended up not being what we wanted. Exactly. And it fell apart and it led us into the, our dreams. Totally. Why is it that so many people that win the lottery yeah. go broke? Yeah. Gifts can turn into curses That's too. True. But because we label them as the best moment in our life or the worst moment in our life. Whereas when you approach things to neutrality and just what you have on the table, you can be like, okay, what am I going to do next? How many of you spend a lot of your days multitasking? Okay, good. So a lot of us spend our time multitasking. Now studies show that only 2% of us are actually able to multitask. And when most people hear that, they're like, yeah, I'm in that 2%. <laughs> That's me, right? I'm in that 2%. Uh, you're probably not, I'm not, because it's only 2% of the global population of the world. Multitasking is a myth. And I find that as spiritual activists, as conscious change makers, as change agents of the world, whatever you wanna call yourself, all of us, one of the biggest mistakes we've seen, and this was the quote that I shared and a thought from Martin Luther King that I've really held close to me, is he said, those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, mm -hmm. right? Those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, i.e. people who are trying to build destruction in the world and distractions in the world are highly organized, highly focused, highly data oriented, highly strategic, highly process driven. And so we have to be the same. And when you spend time with Vision or you spend time with the Mind Valley team, you realize their success is intuitive, it is deep, it is full of love, but it is also highly strategic, it is also highly focused, and therefore it's effective. And so for me, my plea to all of you and to myself is whatever we're gonna do, let's get really strategic about it. Let's bring sincerity and strategy together. Let's bring data and dynamism together. Let's bring intuition and insight together. Right, let's not, let's not look beyond that and think, oh, that stuff's gonna work out because I inten my intention's nice. Right, your intention's not gonna run a mile, but it will help you run the marathon but it's not gonna run that mile that you need to do right now. And so for me, intention and action, intention and attention, both of them are required. And so my recommendation is whatever your dream is, whatever you're inspired by, whatever you think is gonna have a positive impact on the world, bring both to that, right? Don't settle for one or the other. One of the biggest mistakes we make is that we confuse inexperience with being unqualified. So because we've not tried a lot of things, we just naturally believe that we can't be that good at them. Mm -hmm. So if I've never spoken on a stage, I just think, oh, I'm probably not good at that. Or if I've never played golf, I'd probably think, oh, I'm probably not good at that. And so we start writing off things without even trying them. So the best method I can share with someone is take the next month, take the next four weekends in the month that gives you eight days and get really tactical every single day that's why you're playing tennis a lot right now. Yeah, playing tennis. <laughs> Take the eight days, go join a course, an online course, a workshop, go and shadow a friend, go to a seminar, a conference, go to reading a book, listen yeah. to a podcast. Go and expose yourself to eight different things in a month. Eight different things. Eight different things mm -hmm. in a month. And guess what, in a month, you will have learned what you probably would have learned in eight years because mm -hmm. most of us test one new thing a year. Maybe. Maybe, if that, exactly, right? Like some people don't even do that. But if you do eight different things in a month, and this is how you have to see it. 
If you went to eight different restaurants in a month, you ask yourself after you eat a meal, like I had that burrito or I had that taco, did I like it? Right, the first question you ask yourself is you, did I you like it? You gotta try it first. You gotta try it first, you yeah. gotta go to the restaurant. Yeah. There's no point, so you gotta say did I like it? The second question you ask yourself is why did I or why did I not like it? Mm-hmm. Like why is so important? I think too many people just yeah. go, I like it or I don't like it. Why did I like it? And the third question you have to ask yourself really, really simple is, do I wanna do it again? Mm. And if you do, that's where you start uncovering. So my point is, inexperience, do not misinterpret inexperience for a lack of qualification. Envy actually is more of a expression of how we feel about ourselves rather than how we're perceiving someone else. It's actually so much more about how comfortable we feel with who we are, how confident who we feel with who we are, how much self-esteem we have, how much self-assurance we have. Envy is more a root of that than it is of the fact that someone else is doing well. It's less about the fact that someone out there is amazing, making waves, doing something that you want to be doing. It's more about how we feel about ourselves and it's experienced in that way of looking at someone else and reflecting back on us. Social circles, family circles, someone else has done amazingly in the exam, someone just landed a new job, someone else just got promoted and everyone's looking at you going, what are you doing? Right, what have you achieved? Where, where are you today? Where have you got? Right, what's happening with you? Tell us about you. And you're thinking, you know, you're going through all your head, you're trying to come up with all the things that you've thought about, all the things that you've achieved, all the things that you've done, and you're trying to bring it up, like constantly. But you're struggling, you find it hard, because you're now measuring your growth based on someone else's. You're now measuring your success based on someone else's. And that is the biggest challenge with envy. That one of the biggest challenges it brings in our life is that it forces us to start measuring our sex, sorry, our success in comparison to someone else's. That is the biggest challenge with envy. When we start comparing the level of our success with someone else's, you're already on the wrong foot. I really believe that everything we say, I, that beautiful thought from Gandhi where he said that when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in line, then you'll experience harmony. And, and I've really taken that to heart and it's, it's this powerful spiritual principle and it really means a lot think, to me. What you think, what you say. say. And what you do are aligned. Mm. And so for me, any form of language, any form of your emotional vocabulary is building your mental reality. And I think people forget that their vocabulary is defining their life. You are creating your life on a daily basis by the words you use. So for me, and, and I'm not saying that I feel that way about everyone else. I'm saying that's how I feel about that word. Someone may say, oh, when I say a swear word, it, it makes me laugh. For me, it doesn't. That I would only swear when I felt bad. I felt something negative towards something. So for me, that had negative emotions, negative connotations, and negative uh, intention attached to it. So I wanted to remove anything from my vocabulary that I felt was negative. So even as simple as, and I've done this very recently, but it's changed my life. Instead of me saying I'm busy or it's been a busy week, I say I'm having a productive week. And I feel different when I go to bed just by that simple change. I go to bed thinking, yeah, I've had a really productive day today rather than going, God, I had a busy day today. Like, mm. I don't want to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to have a busy day tomorrow. And so that simple emotional vocabulary change has just catapulted my mind into feeling excited and enthusiastic all the time. I start off the chapter with this beautiful thought from yeah. Charles Horton Cooley, and I love telling it because it's just, it's just the best. And I think it was written in like the 1900s. And he said, today the challenge is, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I, I am. am. It's crazy, man. And it's like, it blows my mind every time I say it's it. It gives me the chills, like I feel it. And the reason why I start with identity is because I think that's the root of all our challenges. And the first step to thinking like a monk is starting at the root, not starting at the symptoms or the superficial or the surface level, but let's go to the root. If you're playing a role, if you're wearing a mask, mm -hmm. if you're dressed in clothes that are not yours, 
then you end up living a life that's not yours. Mm. And in the book, I give this example of method acting. Yes, with so, Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah, I'm, I'm a massive movie junkie, and I love method actors. So people like Heath Ledger, of course, from the yes. Dark Knight series. You've got Jared Leto. So Jared Leto, when he played the Joker in, this is not in the book, in Suicide Squad, uh-huh. he used to send dead rats in the mail to his co-stars. He did not. He did, because he was trying to get into the mindset of how someone that perverted would behave. And then Daniel Day-Lewis, when he was filming for Gangs of New York, he's actually wearing these coats that are centuries old so that he can get into character when he's off camera. Yeah, when he can feel it, right? He's not wearing watches. He's not carrying around his mobile phone. They're speaking in the accents. And he talks about how he actually went crazy. Because guess what? When you fake being someone for so long, you think it's your reality. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens to all of us. We play a role at work, we play a role at home, we play a role with our family, we play a role at our friends, and then we think that role is us. Right. And we lose ourselves. And to me, that is the core reason why we're chasing things that are not important to us. We always have been trained to focus on the results. So people ask, what do you want in life? And I'm like, forget that. That's the worst question to ask someone. Because when you ask what you want, that's when the ads come in and you're like, oh, I want that car, I want that home, I want that dress, I want that body, I want whatever it is. My question to you is, what do you wanna wake up and be every day? Like, what do you wanna wake up and do every day? What's the process that you're in love with? So we're thinking about the result, whereas my question is, forget the result, what's the process that you're in love with doing? So start there, first of all. Don't start your journey of saying, I wanna be a movie director because I wanna, you know, I want to hit the blockbuster charts. So I want to do this. Don't make it about that. Like, don't don't be like, I want to be a singer because I want to be Ariana Grande, right? Like, that's not the point. That's just a result. Do you love singing every day? And I realized this with a very honest question to myself. I'm really passionate about football, soccer. I absolutely love the game. I grew up on it. I'm still a huge fan. I missed out on it when I was a monk. I've been catching up ever since. <laughs> like I'm like, oh, any football game. I was just in London last week and I made sure I went, I didn't, couldn't see a game live, but I went and watched it at a, at a bar in London and I love the energy. I'm so passionate about soccer. I don't have what it takes to be a soccer player. Yeah. Like I do not want to wake up at 4 a.m. <laughs> I wake up at 4 a.m. to meditate. When I was a monk, I wake up at six, uh, 5.30 a.m. now to meditate. I do not want to wake up at 4 a.m. to go out on a raining pitch and play soccer. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to be in the gym for four hours a day. I want to meditate for four hours a day, but I don't want to me- uh, play soccer for four hours a day and then be in the gym and train. I'm not envious of any athlete in the world because it takes a different type of mindset. I was really shy. I didn't enjoy stages. I didn't enjoy speaking. My parents forced me to go to public speaking and drama school. So I spent 14 to 18 in public speaking and drama school. Changed my life. I did not know what I wanted to speak about. So even when I finished at 18, I still didn't like going on stage because I didn't have anything to talk about. So now you've got the tools, but you haven't got the passion. So I developed somewhat of an expertise in four years, but I didn't have what I was passionate about. And then when I became a monk, I was like, this is it. This is why I went to public speaking school because I love talking about philosophy. I love talking about science. I love talking about culture. I love talking about life. I love talking about growth, etc. the mind. So I got what I was passionate about when I became a monk. So for me, the process came from four years of consistent public speaking school. Like it changed my life. And, and that's all thanks to my parents for forcing me to go. I had no interest in being a public speaker or a storyteller or any of these things. That was just, I lucked out. And then it was me finding what I was passionate to speak about. And then I've spoken, I've spoken for three hours a day for the last 13 years. And I spoke to audiences of zero, all the way to audiences now of thousands. But when I first started speaking, I remember I was invited to speak at a university where I wasn't getting paid for it. I was like 20 years old. I was invited to speak to this university. No one showed up, twice. So they organized two wow. events for me. I was meant to speak about life, philosophy, et cetera, all the kind of stuff I speak about now and zero people turned up. And I practiced my speech both times to an empty room <clears throat> as if it was a packed room because I was like, I'm still gonna practice. And so for me, having done this for three hours a day for the last 13 years, that's now being gratefully received online. So I'm very fortunate that it's shifted from an offline world to an online world, which we can dive into. Yeah. But the point is it's, it's been my absorption and addiction for like, feet for over a decade now. In the hope for money, in the hope for success, we end up chasing the wrong things and we make a mess. We end up with less than we started with, end up with more issues than we bargained for. 
Whilst climbing that ladder and that stairway, we forget why we started climbing in the first place. Once the king of Bhutan was asked by an interviewer what the GDP of Bhutan was, he was surprised and shocked. He replied by saying, in Bhutan, we don't just measure the GDP, we measure the GNH. Instead of just measuring the gross domestic product, we measure gross national happiness. In the process of getting older, we forget the real goal of life. If you could make a little less and spend more time doing what you love, would that make you happier? Don't trade your happiness for what you think you need. Things can never make us happy because they're temporary and limited, but experiences can last forever. Too many people are working hard on things they don't love, to spend money they don't have, to buy things they don't need, to impress people they don't like. When we create our identity around what we do, a career, a job, an occupation, we can never be happy because we're basing it on something external. But when we create an identity around who we are and what we want to be and become, then anything is possible. And remember, we become successful by what we get, but we become happy by what we give. Don't get the two confused. If you want more top 10 videos, they're not on this channel anymore. I have a dedicated channel just for it. Go check it out. The link is right there next to me. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.